Um, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Ika Lin uh, from University of Michigan. Uh, I'm working with Professor Murray Mao, and I'm really honored to be here presenting this paper, um, Pausing and Resuming Network Flows Using Program Buffers. This is a joint project between University of Michigan and uh, Huawei R&D at Santa Clara. So basically, in this uh, work, uh, we introduced a new um, SDM programming abstraction called Program Buffer to help decouple um, the buffering capability in um, cellular network functions from its control. Um, in today's talk, I will focus on three aspects of the work. Um, why do we need a uh, programmable buffer? How do we use it to pause and resume network flows in the network? And how does an SD application use it in actual scenarios? So uh, to begin with, why is packet buffering critical? Um, Packet buffering is actually fundamental in cellular networks to ensure zero packet loss during frequent um, communication interruptions. Um, let's take a look at this um, illustrative figure of the current LTE network. So between the user devices and the internet, you have the radio access network where the base, uh, the base stations are, and the core network with um, some of the very important uh, network functions like uh, serving gateway, um, packet gateway, and the mobility management entity. So two of the most critical um, services in LTE, um, one is idle mode uh, mobility management, AKA paging, and the other one is active mode mobility management, which handles uh, the user device handing over from base stations to base stations. Um, they require the user downlink data to be buffered at um, the serving gateway and the base station that the device is connected to, um, respectively. So these buffering capabilities are implemented as built-in fixed function um, in those nodes, and they are deeply coupled with uh, the control. And this becomes a serious problem um, in the 5G era, as 5G aims to support diverse devices like um, autonomous vehicles, um, IoT, and also services like machine-to-machine -machine communications. Uh, some of these devices and services require the user data to be the downlink data to be buffered at different points um, inside the network. Um, for example, power-constrained devices like sensors, um, they could adopt a connectionless communication scheme that requires the network to act as a surrogate receiver and temporarily buffer those data before the actual consumer retrieves those data. Um, if you're trying to scale up or scale down your, your network uh, services in the core, uh, you may also need to temporarily buffer those um, traffic. So to support these various emerging requirements um, uh, of buffering with fixed function is simply inflexible and unscalable. That's why, I, um, so the goal here, or, or the ideal case, is that if the network can flexibly control what, uh, where, and how packets are buffered, um, so that we can support um, diverse devices and services coming to 5G. Sort of on the other side of the story, um, as SDN and NFV become like the key, enab key enablers for 5G, um, the industry has devoted quite a lot of effort in trying to SDNize and NFVize uh, the, the Cord network. Um, you can see in, in projects like uh, Accord. So back in when uh, Cord first started, uh, OpenFlow was still quite um, dominant, um, but uh, we know that it's it has limited packet processing capabilities, um, sort of based on predefined protocols, uh, which is why later uh, P4 comes out, uh, gives you the sort of the full packet processing capability where you can define any sorts of uh, protocols. And so P4 would be the ideal um, candidate to give us the full programmability of the packet format and uh, to ex implement all those complicated uh, protocols inside cellular networks. Um, Actually, last month in Mobile World Congress, um, Barefoot just showcased their P4 hardware implementation of the serving gateway. Um, unfortunately, um, these projects or these prototypes, they only capture the packet processing and um, forwarding behaviors of the network functions in cellular. Um, and none of them sort of um, take care of the, the packet buffering behavior, which is why um, this work we propose this called uh, programmable buffer abstraction to try to complete the data plane node abstraction. So with program buffer, 
we will be able to unify the data plane node representation that faithfully captures all its functionalities. As shown in this um, sort of updated uh, cellular network architecture, the control functions, as you can see, um, they are virtualized and moved to the cloud. And latency sensitive operations, um, including um, buffering, are kept on the data plane. You can see the previous nodes, such as serving gateway, um, packet gateway, gateway um, even the base stations, uh, they are now represented with um, an SDN switch um, plus a program buffer or more program buffers. So now, this allows um, the applications to buffer user packets at any points of the network, um, as uh, buffering is now provided as a general service rather than uh, fixed functions that tailor to application-specific requirements. So to make program buffer really usable by SDN applications, um, a few additions are necessary or, or uh, useful to existing SDN frameworks. Our goal here is to make uh, program buffer fully backward compatible with existing SDN applications. In this um, figure that we show on the left-hand side, it's a uh, program buffer enabled SDN architecture. On the control plane, you have the buffer service um, that exposes northbound APIs to applications while it talks to the buffer engine on the data plane with southbound um, buffer APIs. The buffer engine executes these API calls by directly managing the program buffer on the switch. If we take a closer look at the switch, um, program buffers are um, different from existing switch queues, um, which are like, located in import, outboard, and then between different stages of the switch processing pipeline. Um, program buffers are external to the switch pipeline, and they are off path by default, and are only placed on path um, when it's necessary. So to make um, program buffer really instrumental, here we show how to really direct flows in and out of them. Uh, we use virtual ports to bind program buffers to the switch processing pipeline. Um, virtual ports share the same port abstraction for the switch. So from the switch perspective, uh, program buffers are like virtual hosts. So you, uh, to direct flows in and out of program buffer, you just attach, to, attach it to the um, switch pipeline via a V port, and then you install the proper match action um, table entries. Um, note that there are two modes of operation for the virtual ports, receive and transmit. Basically, uh, a, trans, a receive mode port for, uh, allows packets to come in for the buffer, and transmit mode allows packets to go out. Um, the operational state of a program buffer is determined um, solely by the virtual ports that it attaches to. We'll show you in the next slide. So before diving into um, the details of how pausing and resuming works with program buffers, uh, let me just first introduce some basic states of, of them. So uh, if you take a look at the leftmost um, example, um, transmit ports can turn a non-empty buffer into a traffic sync. Uh, we call this serving state. And receive and transmit uh, ports together will make a, a buffer, uh, an overlay queue. We call this forwarding state. Um, receive ports alone will make um, a buffer, a traffic sync. Um, and we call this uh, buffering state. And the, the last two are pretty self-explanatory. So the benefit of embedding buffer states in the modes of the uh, V ports are twofold. On one hand, the, the buffers are uh, made really simple. You don't need to keep track of their own states. Um, the other side, the control applications can manage the buffer states um, very efficiently. We'll show how this works in the next slide. Here we have uh, the examples of uh, pausing and, and resuming with program buffers. So in the first example, a forwarding state buffer is attached to one receive port and one transmit port, and you can see how the, the packets sort of flow through the buffer. Um, by simply changing one of the transmit ports to receive, the buffer is automatically turned into buffering state. So now the uh, packets will be stored in the buffer uh, in order. Likewise, for a buffering state um, buffer, if you change uh, one of the receive ports to transmit, it will automatically change to forwarding state, 
and the packets would be dequeued um, in order. So on an um, operational SDN switch, uh, it's not wise to sort of modify its table entries too frequently. Um, it's error prone and, and could mess up the, the flow priority, flow dependency, and, and other forwarding behaviors. So our way of using virtual port to sort of manipulate um, the buffer states allows control applications to perform pause and resume operations without even touching the table entries. In addition to that, transitions between the pause and resume operation, as I just showed there, only involve one um, operation, which is to change the state, uh, change the mode of the virtual port. Um, next, I will walk through the southbound buffer APIs by showcasing a new way of handling mobility um, that we developed uh, specifically for 5G. So here we are highlighting a solution that we propose to handle ultra-high handover frequencies in 5G. Um, it is designed for very specific um, extreme handover scenarios, like um, small cells with millimeter waves and really high user movement speed. Um, thanks to um, the SDN and NFV technologies in 5G and also the support of program buffer, um, cellular services can decide um, which mobility management solution to uh, enable based on the device types and, and the movement pattern. You can find more uh, background information regarding why this is necessary um, in the paper. So in this simple handover scenario, a user device is connected to one base station. We call it the source base station. And it shows the tendency to hand over to another base station, uh, which we call the target base station. We can see at each base station, the control application has provisioned um, one programmable buffer, one in forwarding state at the source, and one in buffering state um, at the target. To note that the anchor switch now is doing multicasting to both neighboring um, base stations, unlike what's done in LTE. This is to ensure immediate packet availability at each base station as the user handovers. Uh, we show on the right-hand side the basic um, buffer APIs uh, call for, for the preparation or instantiation of those buffers. So when the user device is ready to detach from the source base station, um, the control application will change the state of the source buffer to buffering um, by changing the mode of one of its V ports. Next, instead of redirecting the old path traffic um, from the source base station to the new path, as is done in LTE, the source buffer simply informs the target buffer um, what is the last sent packet so that um, it can purge duplicate packets. This helps eliminate duplicate acknowledgments and reduce the time to first useful packet latency for the user. Finally, as uh, the user reconnects to the target base station, uh, the control application simply changes the state of the target buffer to forwarding, and the connection is now resumed. Um, if you remember from previous slides how uh, the buffer transitions between buffering and forwarding states, uh, you realize that the entire handover process consumes only two buffer API calls. Next, I will briefly touch the proof of concept prototype um, that we built and highlight some of the experiment results. Our prototype of program buffer uh, components are based on open source um, frameworks like uh, the RYU controller and gRPC. We package the program buffers um, as Docker containers uh, for resource isolation and uh, for control applications to be able to choose different buffer implementations by specifying the Docker image. Um, for example, in the 5G mobility management application that I just um, showed, the synchronization mechanism between the, the buffers is a special tweak that we implemented specifically for the application. Um, it works without the control plane involvement. Um, we tested our prototype with um, two popular software switch uh, frameworks, uh, OpenV switch and mSwitch, in our simulations and benchmarks, respectively. mSwitch is a software switch um, built on top of the NetMap framework, um, and that paper actually won the Best Paper Award at SOSR 2015. So if you haven't heard of that, um, I, I recommend that you take a look. So. Now we have the prototype. Uh, the first concern that we have is how scalable is uh, the design of the program buffer. 
In other words, how many user flows a, uh, a single switch can handle. Uh, in this benchmark, we implemented a simple routing module in M-Switch um, that um, direct traffic to different uh, pr uh, program buffers based on the destination IP address. We instantiated up to 2,048 program buffers to handle the same, num uh, the same number of flows. We generate evenly distributed um, flows and measure the aggregate throughput at the output of a switch. And find that um, with over 2,000 buffers, the aggregate throughput still exceeds uh, 100 gigabits per second, uh, which equals to more than 50 megabits per second uh, per user. Uh, we, we done this benchmark with uh, signing only four CPU cores on a commodity server to the, the buffers. Um, we also measure the um, efficiencies of the southbound buffer API calls, uh, which sort of correspond to the control plane scalability. So for comparison, we also measure the, the efficiency uh, of uh, flow modification, which is like the most used um, API call in OpenFlow. So uh, we divide the API calls into two categories, ones that relate to the creation and destruction of um, buffers and virtual ports, and the ones that relate to the management of, the, of them. We find that the first type of API calls have relatively higher latency, um, which is expected, because they involve memory allocation and deallocation. Um, but the, the thing here is that in our measurements, uh, buffers and virtual ports um, have zero idle um, resource footprint, which means we can actually provision them um, instead of creating them on demand. And um, the other API calls, as shown in the table, um, have similar or smaller sort of um, latency than uh, flow modification. And if you remember uh, in the previous introduction, uh, during the whole handover process, we call only twice um, the uh, buffer APIs, which is as many as uh, the flow modification API calls. Not to mention that uh, decoupling of buffering and control um, allows the controller to actually scale independently from the data plane, regardless of the, the traffic volume that's handling. Um, last but not least, we present a um, simulation result um, based on the 5G mobility management application that we um, developed. So with the, sim, uh, the same simple handover scenario, we simulate with different sort of handoff um, durations and handoff intervals to cover a wide range of handover frequencies in 5G. We calculate the optimal um, uh, value by um, dividing the amount of data sent from the server uh, by the total residence time of the UE uh, connected to the, uh, each base station. So here in this figure, uh, the x-axis is the handoff frequency and the y-axis is the flow completion time. Um, we can see or actually the, the data shows that um, our solution incurs less than 5% um, degradation or overhead compared to the optimal um, number. And we pick um, one of these settings and um, implemented two other alternative approaches uh, for comparison. One uses the SDN controller as the buffer, which resembles the approach adopted in the OpenNF paper. And the other one, uh, buffers nothing, which basically relies on TCP retransmission. Um, so it, it serves as a baseline. So you can see in this figure, uh, actually that the y-axis is the, the throughput now. This is trying to um, make it more clear the, the difference between different approaches. So you can see here, basically the other two alternative approaches uh, barely handle um, these extreme handover um, conditions, while our solution, as I said earlier, has less than 5% overhead. So uh, the frequencies on uh, the left half of this, uh, the second figure is actually um, pretty realistic in 5G um, based on our back of the level calculations. So don't be intimidated by the 50 handovers per second. That's pretty outrageous. But even, even that, uh, just showing how robust the, the design is, um, not that it's actually going to happen. Um, so before I conclude, uh, there are a few limitations of the, the current design. Uh, first and foremost, it's not designed originally for hardware switches, because um, uh, due to the several reasons, say uh, you can't dynamically attach or detach virtual ports, uh, it's really hard to, to dynamically allocate um, the resources on the hardware switches for, for buffering purposes. Not to mention that OpenFlow and P4 don't even have that 
um, capability. However, we have been in touch with uh, the ONNF uh, P4 community, um, and, and I think it's, it's possible to adapt uh, the design for, for hardware specifically. Uh, second of all, uh, since we're using memory to, to buffer those packets, uh, it's probably not su directly suitable for, for large uh, volume data storage, uh, which is pretty typical in C CDN applications. Um, what we can do is that we can use um, hard disks instead of memory. Another uh, sort of future work, just to mention, uh, we can offload uh, certain control from controller to the buffer engine to achieve even better um, scalability and, and latency. So uh, just to conclude, um, in this work, we proposed a new SDN program abstraction called Program Buffer. We designed efficient uh, ways of parsing and resuming network flows with uh, the, the abstraction. And we uh, have simple APIs for migrating existing applications. Um, and innovating new applications. Any questions? Let's thank our speaker.